on the western edge of the Pacific. A wild, mysterious place. Of many faces. Papua New Guinea. Where rugged terrain and isolation has allowed hundreds of ancient cultures to thrive. Each with their own fascinating and compelling traditions. From the remote highlands to pristine islands. Tribal life. A celebration of the unique sights, sounds, and rhythms of Papua New Guinea. The island of New Guinea lies north of the Australian mainland. Papua New Guinea lays claim to the eastern side of the island, while the other half is made up of two Indonesian provinces. PNG itself is comprised of 22 provinces, six belonging to the southern region. Every country has a gateway city. A place that introduces the world to its people and their culture. In Papua New Guinea, that honor goes to Port Moresby. Moresby, as it's known locally, is one of the largest cities in the South Pacific. With a population of about 400,000. As the country's capital, it boasts many landmarks, such as Parliament House. This impressive building is an architectural salute to the traditional spirit houses seen in the East Sepik province. Like any other metropolis, Port Moresby is a cultural magnet, attracting tribal groups from all over. Today, some have come to a wildlife park in the city to share their talents and stories. These performers belong to the Roro community, which has about 32 villages in the Kairuku district of the central province. is about the legend of the formation of their tribe and Roro's many villages. Yellow is a color widely used in the Kairuku district, featured in face paint and traditional garments. The bright yellow spice, turmeric, is common to local gardens and is used as a natural dye to stain sago palm fibers. The patterns on the women's skirts show which part of the village they belong to. While 
yellow is traditionally associated with love and happiness, red is the color of life and power. Their body decorations, or bilas, add an extra layer of meaning to their traditional attire. Strings of dog's teeth are part of a family's wealth, proudly worn and shown off at special ceremonies. Shell necklaces are also prestigious, especially the large crescent-shaped kina shells. In Roro villages, they are called Mairi. The white discs with the black markings are called Koyo. They are clan totems. Roro people live close to the coast, reflecting that their Koyo represent shells. Another prized body decoration are bird of paradise plumes. The Roro dancers featuring them in their headdresses and armbands. Within the same wildlife park where the villagers are performing, some of these famous birds are quietly perched. This is a Ragiana bird of paradise, the nation's symbol. Thanks to their vivid plumage, these iconic creatures can't help but attract attention. The bright orange plumes seen on the male's rumps are used during courtship displays. Another group of striking native animals residing in the park are cassowaries the third largest birds on the planet. The helmet-like structure on their head is called a cask. It is like a natural radiator, allowing excess heat to escape, helping to keep these massive flightless birds cool. Up in the branches lives an unusual type of marsupial, tree kangaroos. Their grippy foot pads and long flowing tails give them extra stability as they move around the canopy. There are 14 species of tree kangaroos found in the world. Twelve of them in the forests of Papua New Guinea. Down below, in the grounds of the wildlife park, another group is ready to dance. Performer Patricia Simoy is proud to announce their place of origin. We are from Tufi, Benefia tribe. We're in the Oro province. He is our elder. I'm his daughter, and this is his grandchildren. Uh, so we are one family. Their traditional dress is made of tapa a kind of bark cloth. The feathers are made from bird of paradise and the feathers, it's passed on to generation.
we love dancing. Oral dance is a very unique, so we teach our children to keep this tradition, that the tradition is not dying out. But we love our culture, and then we respect our culture. Because we are Papua New Guineans, and we need to identify ourselves uh, to show that we are Papua New Guineans. We love to see people come and see us, see our country. To the northwest of downtown Port Moresby lies an unusual community, Hanawabada. It is one of two stilt villages remaining in the capital. In the Motu language, Hanawabada means big village, which it is with about 15,000 occupants. Residents move around the network of houses via elevated wooden pathways. This village was established on stilts over water in the belief it would keep the occupants safe from bad spirits and black magic. The Motu are Polynesian by descent, their seafaring forefathers settling widely throughout the eastern tip of what is now PNG, over 2,000 years ago. During World War II, fires destroyed the original wooden thatch houses, modern materials being used to rebuild them, allowing this community and its traditions to endure. In the future, living along the coastline will become a challenge for many residents. Climate change research showing sea levels are rising seven millimeters a year in the PNG region. Double the global average. Coastal communities will no doubt respond by moving their homes and gardens to higher ground, with islanders most likely relocating to the mainland. Once visitors leave Port Moresby and the National Capital District, they enter the surrounding central province. Which stretches from the southern coast across to the jagged peaks of the Owen Stanley Range. Driving east from Moresby is a steady climb. Within 30 kilometers, stunning mountain panoramas are one reward for travelers. Rona Falls is another, a thunderous spectacle. It's fed by the Laloki River. Gravity powering the waters as they surge down the gorge on their journey to the coast. Another 20 kilometers up the road 
is Oa's Corner, which sits 635 meters above sea level. This place is the western entry point of the notoriously rugged Kokoda Track, a series of age-old trading routes made famous by an arduous campaign staged along it during World War II. Every year, over 5,000 hikers take up the challenge of conquering the 96 kilometers of this treacherous yet spectacular trail. On the other side of these sawtooth ridges lies a new province, Millen Bay, which takes up the eastern end of the mainland, then spills out onto the edge of the Pacific. Over 435 islands belong to the province. Some located many kilometers offshore. With 80% of its population living on islands, access to watercraft is essential. So are nautical skills. The capital, Alatau, sits on the northern shore of the province's namesake, Milin Bay. It is a popular port, docked cruise ships often hosting lively cultural performances on their decks. This group is from Rabe village, a short drive west of Alatau. This dance is called Balu, something that was performed when warriors returned from battle. Being part of the dance troupe gives these villagers the opportunity to share their heritage with people from around the globe. <laughs> this is not the only kind of greeting given in Alatau. Eye-catching reenactment shows how canoes were welcomed home after hunting and trading voyages. The paddles are made from quilla, a type of local hardwood. Having a pointy end allowed them to double as a spear if needed. Now the canoes are on shore, the intricate carvings on their prows can be admired. The headboards identify the clan owner of the canoe, much like a ship's flag indicates its country of origin. The town markets are another place to get a close look at local handicrafts. 
The ocean's influence on Alatau's carvers is obvious. This piece depicts a deadly stonefish, squid, sharks, and seahorses have also been expertly crafted. Many carvings feature polished inlaid shells. Millen Bay, like other parts of PNG, has many reminders of World War II. Here was where the Allies had their first major victory in the Pacific Campaign, defeating Japanese land forces. This led to the area being promoted, becoming an important military base from which subsequent operations were mounted. Decades later, Evidence of Millen Bay's wartime past can still be found, like these landing barges, slowly rusting in forests near Alatau. American armed forces dumped these vessels a kilometer from the coastline to ensure they would never fall into enemy hands. The dense jungle did an excellent job concealing them. These days, sites like this give the people of Millen Bay the opportunity to proudly impart the vital role their homeland played in the Allies' success. Time to leave the mainland and voyage northeast into the Solomon Sea to a cluster of coral atolls known as the Trobriands. <coughs> Kitava is one of the main islands in the group and is a regular stop for cruise ships. This is an example of a Trobriand cricket dance. Teams will perform these as they entered or exited the cricket field. The aim, to taunt the opposing team. The game of cricket was introduced to the area by missionaries in an attempt to distract the islanders from their traditional interests, magic, procreation and gardening. Trobriands, horticultural success greatly depends on adept skills in the other two activities. <laughs> Cricket dances are performed in militaristic style rows. The inspiration for this formation coming from marching soldiers based on the islands during World War II. The moves in cricket dances often mimic elements of the sport, whilst also cheekily asserting the manliness of the performers. The chants called out during these dances changed often, reacting to local gossip or news, giving teams the ability to mock their rivals with fresh material at every match. This 
island has a population of about 3,000, and its youngest are eager to share their talents. Skirt or lap lap designs differ from island to island. Those worn on Catawba are made using banana plant or palm fibers. The pelting rain does not dampen their spirits. When the dancing is over, the youngsters are keen to show off their island home. <laughs> Despite having regular contact with foreigners, village life continues here as it has for thousands of years. One staple commonly seen growing in their gardens is the yam. The plants are often trained onto stakes to ensure the leaves receive even sunlight. The starchy tubers growing underground play an important role in Trobriand culture. Not just food, yams are currency, symbols of wealth, prestige, and power. The bigger, the better. During harvest, they are displayed and admired, then stored in special yam houses, an intriguing custom of old that continues to be observed in present-day Millen Bay. The next destination in this province is south of the Trobriands, five kilometers off the southeastern tip of mainland PNG, Samurai Island. This small dot in the ocean has the same amount of dry land as 29 football fields. During colonial times, this modest town served as the provincial capital. As such, it was a potential target during the Second World War. In anticipation of a Japanese assault, Many of Samurai's buildings were purposely dismantled or burnt down so as to leave nothing of value for the enemy. The invasion never happened, but the damage to the town was done. Yet, somehow, this church survived. St. Paul's Anglican Church has graced the main street of Samurai Island since the beginning of the 20th century. Its glory days are long gone, ornate stained glass windows being the last remaining evidence of its past grandeur. A few holy items 
are yet to be relocated to the rectory next door, where services are now held. Once known as the Pearl of the Pacific, Samurai Island was declared a National Heritage Site in 2006, in recognition of its historical importance. In amongst the heritage-listed buildings lies the local primary school. Class is in session. There are three levels of education in PNG, primary, secondary and tertiary. The primary or community schools, like this one, instruct children aged 7 to 12. Starting school, pre-primary age children are taught their local language in the village. This way, they can speak in their own tongue prior to beginning school, where they will start to learn English. Like anywhere else in the world, students look forward to the end of the school day. Some older boys have other plans, to meet up with a friend on Deka Deka Island, south of Samurai. A short paddle takes them to their sandy hangout. Three hundred metres long and two hundred metres wide, a place filled with potential adventures. Next up, a journey to the outskirts of Milan Bay province. 160 kilometers offshore, in the warm waters of the Coral Sea, lie the conflict islands. There are 21 in total, with a permanent population of less than 30 people most of which work on Panacesa Island, an eco-resort. This remote locale sits on the rim of a sunken volcano. The traditional way to get around this chain of islands is to sail on board an outrigger canoe. The breeze is strong. The boat's hull slice through the water as it zips across the lagoon. Back on Panacessa, a stretch of sand makes an ideal setting for locals to perform. 
This group come from the Des Moines Islands, east of Panacessa, a short sail away. The dancers' moves mimic the large sea eagles that soar above these waters. Their face paint is typical of Milan Bay province. The circles and spots are their versions of beauty marks. Dancing comes to an end, so too does the day. The rosy afterglow sets the scene for Panacessa's final delight a full moon rise over open water. Heading northwest from the conflict islands takes visitors back to mainland PNG and into Oro province that has the Owen Stanley Range at its back and the Solomon Sea lapping on its shores. One coastal area, renowned for its beauty above and below the waterline, is Tufi. Divers consider these waters world class. With a stunning array of marine life swarming around its coral outcrops. Many tropical favourites can be spied around Tufi's reefs. Bright sea stars. Giant clams. Vibrant clownfish. Endlessly darting in and out of their anemone homes. Sea snakes are also known to glide along these sandy floors. Local snorkelers use chunks of coral, like the rungs of a ladder, to pull themselves deeper. surface, Tufi stands out geographically. It is located on one of many rias, drowned river valleys.
Locally, these lush inlets, formed by eroded lava flows, are called fjords. When outsiders make the effort to venture to this unusual coastline, Tufi locals make them feel welcome. The canoe ride along the channel gives the opportunity to absorb these unique surroundings. The fjords of Tufi can reach depths beyond 90 metres, and their steep sides can loom up almost twice that distance. Before any may enter this area at the base of the fjord, which is owned by three tribes, permission must be sought from the trio of local chiefs. <laughs> this friend or foe reenactment shows how Tufi has been dealing with trespassers for generations. The blackened skin of these warriors was a sign to any uninvited guests that matters would get deathly serious if their intentions were not of a friendly nature. When our ancestors migrated into this field, we had warriors like this from each tribe who were trying to threaten other clans as they came in to settle here. The people of Tufi have many cultural art forms to demonstrate, some having particular significance. Oro province is known for facial tattooing. In times past, it was a rite of passage for young women to have these ornate patterns applied to show they were ready to marry. The design is painted onto the skin using squid ink or ground up charcoal. Then, a thorn is used to pierce the skin, making a permanent stain. Today is simply for show. When this young girl is in her teens, she may choose to carry on the custom and proudly display the face of an initiated woman. The women of Oro province are also renowned for their tapa cloth. The cloth here is the, um, is the bark of the tree, uh, which is uh, the mulberry bark. And uh, the colors and the designs are all from the natural colors, from out of the leaf of trees and the bark of trees. Another important tree to all Papua New Guineans is the sago palm. Mattocks carved from branches reduce the inner core to a pulp. After the rinsing stage, a starchy mound of sago is ready for an earth oven. They can bake it on the fire, yeah. or they can mix it with a fish, smoked fish, and then make a soup. Uh, my favorite is with fish. Once the embers are swept away, the cooked sago can be taken from the fire. The skin on top is not discarded, 
but instead prized, having a similar texture to chewing gum. Then it's ready to be wrapped. Taste of it. <laughs> Green pandanus leaves are strapped around the baked sago with plenty of overlapping to ensure the contents stay fresh. This carefully wrapped bundle will last for about a week. There is an art to everything these villagers do. Their food, their clothing, their elaborate headdresses. This is from the, the rainbow lorikeet. And this one, this one here comes from the, um, the eastern black cap lorry. Cockatoo, chicken and bird of paradise plumes have also been used in these headdresses. Precious artifacts handed down by previous generations. This is the type of song that would be heard during a feast in Tufi. It is sung in Karafi, one of 35 languages spoken in Oro province. These performances give those involved an opportunity to show off the finery of their bilas. The conch has spoken. Its fanfare signals the end of this Tufi experience. Moving through the fjord, it's a tranquil journey. A chance to ponder the natural wonder of this country and the rich, diverse culture of the Papua New Guinean people. better to sum up life in PNG than a local, like Grace Avodaba from Bags Village near Tufi. It's a very beautiful place. We like it. It's so lovely. Well, we have all sorts of uh, fruits, vegetables, greens, we grow them. We don't need money to buy them. <laughs> We go down into the sea, we catch fish. We have shellfish, all different types of shellfish. When we go into the bagels, we catch crabs, free everywhere. We go into the bush, we catch uh, pigs, wild pigs, fowls, birds. We have all sorts of animals for meat. We get our own materials to build our own homes. We don't spend money to buy timber or iron. We use this materials. We travel by canoes. We make them. We need money for our children's school fees because education is very important at these times.
The PNG Way of Life. Successfully merging the new with the old. A remarkable place. Inhabited by extraordinary people.